How are we doing tonight, folks? Hello, can you guys hear me at all? I can hear you. Okay, good, thank you, Trey. All right, any questions before we go ahead and get going, guys? No? All right, so let's go ahead and we're gonna talk about, obviously, how nutrition is going to be influencing our training adaptations. So one thing that my advisor at Kansas was always a big fan of was ask yourself, what is the mechanism? There always needs to be a mechanism that drives any change that you're going to get the body to do. So if we can find what the mechanism is, we can hopefully figure out how to exploit it so that we're going to get more of the changes we're looking for or we can obviously try to avoid setting off that mechanism if it's going to do things that we don't want. So with that being said, we start off with just the basics, so to speak. And that turns out when we're training, we're trying to get better because we're applying some type of stimulus to not just the muscles, but the fibers in those muscles that we're utilizing, which is then going to hopefully cause some type of adaptation, some changes in cellular signaling, which in turn is going to give us the response. So if we're going to do endurance training, we can see the myriad of effects we're gonna have. If we're going to do strength training, we can see the myriad of effects we're gonna have and how it's going to be relative to the trained status of the organism before they started on that program. And then obviously the intensity of that stimulus relative to what that organism has experienced before. Now, this is all done via what's known as signaling pathways. A signaling pathway really, guys, is just effectively, think of it as a flow chart or what's known as a Rube Goldberg machine. Have any of you guys ever seen a music video by the band called OK Go? Okay, so Stephanie has it. So, we're effectively, have any of you guys played the old school board game Mousetrap? where you build the trap slowly but surely. Taryn, I don't know what happened you with your youth, but you need to tell your parents that uh, it's not fair for you to live your life in straight up silence, not able to go and do anything. No, so effectively it's one thing causes another thing to move, which causes another thing to move, and then eventually you, know, you catch the mouse at the end, or the OK Go music videos, which are insane but pretty entertaining, where it's, we are doing that initial stimulus that's causing these things to then signal down that we're going to cause this activation pathways. So for example, what we're having here, and this is gonna be the major overarching one we're seeing throughout, which is we have the signal. This can be because of stretch on the muscle. This can be because of calcium release. This can be because of activation of certain proteins or the application of certain hormones, which is in turn going to literally influence our DNA expression. So we're going to then get transcription. So we're getting DNA, which is now signaling RNA. This RNA in turn is going to be leaving and going out into translation into the proteins we're actually looking for. And those proteins are going to give us that effect. So we're literally increasing the number of proteins related to metabolism, or we are increasing the amount of actin and myosin. So we're going to have more sarcomeres inside of the muscle. All of these are going to literally be built because of the signaling that's occurring. Now, this signaling cascade is going to start because, well, we're doing something to the cell. 
So for example, when you look at the image on the left, we've got signaling if we're doing things like resistance training that is going to be activating what's known as the mechanistic target of rapamycin, uh, mTOR, which used to be known as the mammalian target of rapamycin, which in turn is going to activate other proteins, which are going to literally influence DNA translation. Now, on the other side, folks, we have more of a theoretical, so mechanical stress, so just the working of what we're going to see, it's going to have, through both calcium and AMP production, activate different kinases. And in fact, in this example, it's going to be actually AMPK. And then AMPK is going to be slightly influencing translation, but mostly it's going to be in turn affecting what will be TSC, mTOR, and all the way down through the signaling until we eventually are getting our literal transcription of the, those proteins. So this is how, literally, once again, we're getting this signaling to occur. This can be pretty darn complicated. Have I lost anybody so far? I guess not. So. AMPK is a signaler that's going to let the body know when you have in an adequate amount of calories. So when your cell happens to have not have enough calories because we've done a lot of aerobic style work, it's going to actually decrease muscle protein synthesis. It's going to blunt it. That's why if we look at this image over here, we can see how it's a flat bar. So we're actually going to be shutting down building more muscle because we don't have enough calories inside of the cell. It's going to also be shuttling more energy towards glycolysis. So this is a natural activation from aerobic style exercise and specifically high volumes of aerobic work. Now this is also going to activate what's known as PGC1 alpha. PGC1 alpha is literally a signaling protein that is in turn going to cause increase in the numbers of mitochondria inside of your cells. And these primary signals, which is going to be nutrients and exercise, which once again is causing AMPK levels to rise, which is going to activate TGF beta activin kinase, PKB, and calmodulin kinase into all influencing AMPK. AMPK is a secondary messenger because it goes from the primary signal, which is the actual training, the actual exercise, anything else along the line, to that secondary signal, which in turn is going to go on to the tertiary signals and the actual expression that we're looking for. Now, on the other side, we have building muscle in that we are going to have through insulin like growth factor one and also insulin convected, which is gonna affect insulin receptor one substrate, phospholinositol three kinase, which is in turn going to activate eventually AKT, which actually affects uh, the FOXO and MRF box, which actually lead to shutting down atrophy pathways inside of the cell. So that's that activation I talked about earlier, or deactivation. And then through GSK, uh, sorry, GSK3 beta, um, tumor sclerotic complex 2, and getting mTOR to effectively um, complex, what's up, Bahamut, with Raptor, you're going to get the phosphorylation of P70S6 kinase and for eukaryotic uh, binding protein one, which is going to let go of eukaryotic initiating factor 4E. You can tell things that I had to memorize in my PhD, which in turn is going to cause that translation which we're looking for. Okay, it's just a signaling cascade. A goes to B, goes to C, goes to D. And don't worry, obviously, all this is online, so you can listen to it over and over again if you'd like to. Now, when we're talking about this time course, the initial training itself, this signal is gonna effectively rise and be giving, really only working for about a minute or so. That's the actual burn you're feeling in the muscle, the mechanical tension you've got going through it from the work you're doing, the calcium that's being released, so on and so forth. That gets resolved. Then we have the activation of that AMPK, mTOR, um, AKT, all of those which will then be activated for minutes and quite possibly hours, which in turn is going to cause that transcription and translation to be increased 
for probably quite possibly a day and then the overall actual building of more protein in the muscle that's usually going to last from anywhere from 24 all the way up to 72 hours so hard training is going to increase muscle protein synthesis for about three days so you don't have to train muscles every single day some of them can deal with mechanical loading more so than others but the big caveat here is if you're trying to maximize building muscle, you're going to effectively have to stimulate that muscle at least typically twice per week so that you're going to have that protein synthesis levels increased over baseline chronically because, I mean, that's the goal. You're trying to build muscle, not get smaller and weaker. And this is literally thanks to the intramuscular signaling pathways and the rate of which they're going to go ahead and proliferate that signal so that you are going to get the results you're looking for. Now, nutrition is going to affect these adaptations. Specifically, what we find if you happen to have naturally higher amounts of carbohydrate level inside of your cells, higher glycogen levels, and then you have someone trained to exhaustion, we're going to find over the length of a training period, if you keep them on a lower carbohydrate program, they're actually going to enhance their total tolerance because they're going to increase the signaling pathways for doing or essentially maintaining aerobic metabolism because they cannot lean so hard on anaerobic metabolism because they don't have the carbohydrate storage that they can essentially pull from. Now, notice, guys, the big difference here is the increase in this is going to be citrate synthase of almost doubling from an individual that's training on a low carbohydrate diet as opposed to a high carbohydrate diet. So that's literally the true mechanism of why you can see more of a positive effect in certain nutritional decisions if you're looking to once again cause certain chronic adaptations to the individual. Does that make sense to you guys? All right, so I guess since it makes sense, yeah, Chad, Go and explain it to me. Whenever you're ready. And Chad might be away from keyboard. That's okay. So, Courtney. You're up. That's okay. That's okay. So Dalton, go for it. Thank you, Sam. I appreciate you guys being honest. Dalton, Dalton give it a shot. I unmuted you. Yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> okay. So let's do this. Can you guys – oh, no, no, don't run away, Dalton. You, you on mute, man. I got you on the line now. You and me, we're going to talk. We're going to hang out. When did it stop making sense? Uh, I understood the last slide when you were talking about um... – Muscle building up for three days. This one was a little confusing though. Okay. Okay. So when we're talking about train low and train high, what macronutrient are we talking about? Carbs. Okay. So that's obviously how much we're taking in the diet. All right. Now, notice when we look over here, the individuals that happen to be on the lower carbohydrate diet, they were able to go for longer periods of time compared to the individual on the high carbohydrate diet. 
given a time to exhaustion test. Okay, that makes sense. In glycogen stores, in the actual muscle cells of the individuals on a low carb diet compared to a high carb diet, from what we've learned so far. Wait, what was the question? It's okay. What's the difference in glycogen storage in somebody's muscles that's on a high carb diet as opposed to being on a low carb diet? Uh, high carb, they'll have more storage, won't they? Bingo. So if you've got more storage of glycogen in one muscle or one person, you can think of it that way, compared to another person, the person that doesn't have as much glycogen in their muscles, what energy systems are they going to have to rely on more when you're doing something that notices lasting minutes, not seconds, but minutes? Um, aerobic or beta oxidation or... Yeah, yeah, no, you're both, both systems, aerobic glycolysis, because that's much yeah. more efficient use of the carbohydrates we have, and beta oxidation, okay? Okay. You still with me? Yeah. Okay, so now, if we go back up here, and notice how if we naturally have a greater amount of AMP, and when do we have more AMP in our cells? Uh, I, I don't know. When do we have a lot of ATP in our cells? Uh, during exercise or training. Would we have more ATP in our cells at rest or during exercise? Uh, rest. Bingo. So when we're exercising, the AMP levels are going to go up because we're using the ATP, so it's going down. Make sense? Yes. So that, in turn, is going to lead to the activation of this AMPK. And since we don't have as much glycolysis or uh, glucose, specifically in glycogen form, in that low carb individual, we're going to be activating AMPK more. And if we activate AMP AMPK, specifically, look at the bottom effects. What is that in turn going to do? Uh, build more mitochondria. Yes. Okay. And we're also increasing our mitochondria. What else goes along with increasing the mitochondria? We come back over here. Um, increase in muscle or? I think enzymes related to energy production. Uh, I don't know. It's okay. The cursor is right underneath it. Yeah, I don't, <laughs> I don't know what C is. Okay, citrate synthase. Okay. It's one of the major rate limiters in the citric acid cycle. Okay. So, hence the people that are on a low-carb diet, they're actually increasing their amount of mitochondria and the enzymes related to aerobic metabolism compared to the per people on the high-carb diet, hence why notice they were able to last longer after training low for a long, a long enough period of time. Okay. Now does it make sense? Yeah, it helps out a lot. Yeah, no, and that's okay. Like if, if you're struggling with it, a lot of other people are struggling with it and it only took me starting to pick on people randomly that Chad had to brush his teeth at four o'clock in the afternoon during a lecture. So, you know, it's okay. You guys are here to learn, but you got to let me know when you guys are, it's not making sense because it turns out I have a PhD in this. So I've had to look at it a lot. Whereas, you know, you guys, it's pretty new. So do you feel, you feel more comfortable now when we talk about these training adaptations? Yes, I do. Cool. So don't worry. You survived. Next up, I'm going to be picking on is Daniel. So make sure you don't run off to go brush your teeth, bud. All right. Once again, nutrition is going to influence us. Oh, Daniel already unmuted himself. He's ready to roll. I like it. So we can talk about how there might be some advantages to training without breakfast, how taking in carbohydrates during exercise might actually diminish a little bit of the total amount of signaling to enhance performance we're going to get. But we can think of it also as a tactical decision, because what are we really trying to focus on? 
And when it comes to leucine, that's going to specifically act on that mTOR pathway, which is the one that's going to increase what, Daniel? I don't know. It's okay. So let's go back again. If we're going back to mTOR, what's mTOR do? Uh, looks like it binds to Raptor, mm -hmm. and then it activates either P70 or 4E. Good. And then those in turn increase what? The translation of fat. No, no, no. Protein. This Protein. is increasing muscle mass. You want the activation of mTOR in muscle because that's actually what's helping push muscle synthesis, muscle protein synthesis. Now, you have to be careful because it turns out mTOR is in pretty much all the cells in your body, and mTOR tends to go off the rails in cancer cells. So the cells are growing almost perpetually. And that's part of the mechanism what's causing it. Now, antioxidants, we've touched on them briefly before. You want to actually produce some reactive oxidative species because they do that, they do actually cause activation of those signaling proteins inside of your cells. And same thing, we want to be careful about using. NSAIDs, so non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, because they actually decrease, once again, the signaling that would naturally occur to allow for our tissues to recover more effectively. So, does that make sense, Daniel? Yeah, it does. Okay, and so what I've got down here, guys, is actually looking at the processes that are going to increase the amount of capillaries we have going to our muscles. And the major signaling protein is going to be what's known as VEGF. That in turn is going to cause not just changes on uh, essentially our signaling inside of our mitochondria, but they in turn are going to be increasing literally the amount of capillaries feeding to an individual um, muscle cell. Now, Daniel has survived, and we will touch finally on overtraining or overreaching. We've talked about overreaching and overtraining exercise physiology, where it's an issue of, once again, applying too much stress to too little recovery for the organism. Now, we're going to find that overall it's going to be diminishing the total amount of muscle glycogen, which is going to cause to a decrease in performance. Now, there is some research that shows that glutamine might be useful for helping a little bit with immune function, but it doesn't really seem to enhance uh, performance. It doesn't really enhance muscle mass or recovery there. It might be a little bit, sounds better than that. Oh, sorry. Uh, it's probably better to just get in complete proteins than to worry about it. And then uh, Taryn has a good question, which is it's better not to use NSAIDs and let it naturally heal. Uh, Yes, as long as your inflammatory signaling is not too excessive. So you're using NSAIDs as a way to naturally diminish your body's own inflammatory signaling. And you can get to be in too much of a pro-inflammatory state. And when that occurs, you do want to use things like NSAIDs, but it's, it's a give and a take. So things like NSAIDs, and things like even using like the Normatec boots, uh, the things that use essentially what's well, most like peristalsis, where it's essentially a milking to try to get out some of those inflammatory biomarkers around the muscles to allow them to feel a little bit more comfortable and for you to recover a little bit faster. It actually diminishes the total amount of supercompensation you would have had otherwise. So you have to ask yourself, what's more important for your athlete? to be a little bit more sore, but to get a little bit more out of the training, so they can be a little bit bigger, a little bit more muscular, uh, a little bit stronger for it over the long haul, or to be ready to play and or practice at a high level again. So we have these tools in the toolbox. The key is when do we want to apply them? So we obviously point out the advantages of doing the uh, train low, compete high. So you have that lower carb intake. It's going to have more positive effects on mitochondrial number and enzymatic changes to the cell, probably also capillarization to those cells. But the big issue with it is, if you're a cross-country athlete, that's totally what we want. But if you are a soccer player, what's more important is that you are a better 
soccer player, which if your aerobic performance is what's holding you back, then yeah, we need to focus on that. But for most athletes, it tends to be the skills of the sport that's really what holds them back. So we need to do effectively whatever it takes to make it so that they're going to be able to stay out there and practice with a higher level of focus and precision. So that's why using, giving people carbohydrates during practice can be a better choice. Now, BCAAs have been touted as things to help with recovery, and specifically it's going to be leucine, the one that helps with the increasing intramuscular signaling, which is useful because, yeah, you're putting yourself in a pro um, anabolic state and also helping keep yourself out of a catabolic state in that situation. But the issue with the Bing is it's just one uh, source of essential amino acids. You need all of the essential amino acids in order to really have true protein synthesis and increasing muscle size. So it's not really worth spending the money on BCAAs. It's effectively flavored water and hasn't really shown a whole lot of efficacy in any of the research that I've seen that really makes it worthwhile. But to get in a good complete protein that has a decent leucine load, typically like your milk-based proteins, is usually your best bet for maximizing protein synthesis post-workout. And uh, Jackson has a question about the use of arginine. Arginine, the goal there is to use it more as a vasodilator, some nitric oxide production. Uh, from the research out there, your better option is actually use uh, nitrates and nitrites, and you can do that through things like beetroot powder or uh, the amino acid uh, citrulline malate, because the problem is arginine gets converted upon digestion, so you actually aren't able to absorb as much as you hope to specifically increase the nitric oxide production, whereas citrulline is actually going to convert over to arginine and gives you more um, effectively of that vasodilatory effect. So any questions about cellular signaling before we move on? Any questions? I'm just knocking it out of the park that well. Okay, well then. Let's go ahead and talk ourselves a little about body composition. Now, all of you guys have had exercise uh, physiology before, so a lot of this should be pretty familiar. And really all we're trying to do with our athletes is just to try to aim. Yeah, you're right, Courtney. You're currently in it right now where we're talking about body composition. Uh, so yeah, don't worry, we're not gonna go too fast, but if you want me to go ahead and elaborate on anything else for a little bit longer, just let me know, it's no problem. Now, what we're going to find is, yeah, we have the whole basic idea of body fat percentage ranges for different athletes and or for different genders, you're going to typically find your average female is about six to 10% higher in body fat than your average male, usually somewhere around eight. But even then, body composition is obviously influenced, influenced by a myriad of things. You've got physical activity level, you've got nutrition, and you've got genetics, and then you've got recovery. All of those combined are going to give you what you... Uh, Typically have. Well then, Courtney, I will take as much time on the body comp stuff as you need, or any of you guys need for that matter. So when we're working with an athlete, it's important that you look at athletes that not just are the elite in the sport, because it turns out elite athletes are the ones that are effectively typically the perfect specimen to truly excel at that sport. Now, when you're dealing with middle school and high school, instead it's like, okay, which athletes tend to be pretty good at that level? And what do they have in common? And we're usually gonna see there's a pretty decent diversity in a lot of sports when it comes to body composition. And what's most important is we try to figure out what's the optimal competition for that athlete in their role in the sport, and then what's something that's gonna be probably a good overall lifestyle decision uh, for them over the long haul, because we don't want to go ahead and just try to be, 
you know, something that's incredibly difficult for them to maintain on both ends of the spectrum for being incredibly lean or have incredibly high amounts of body weight, which is going to typically cause a, a considerable amount of body fat gain. We want to figure out what's going to be useful for them to be healthy and happy. Now, I love the body fat percentages for the average population. Uh, that's freaking hilarious because obviously they haven't been out in public anytime recently. Then again, none of us are out in public any really at all right now. So that doesn't, that's not really the best indicator. But you want to figure out where, again, do we have the best outcomes? Now, when we're talking about overweight and obese, this is by true body fat percentages. Now, you can be obese by body fat and still have a completely normal metabolic profile, meaning insulin, blood glucose, A1C, cholesterol, both HDL and LDL, and effectively be a completely normal health individual. Now, you can also be of what's considered good or acceptable or even athletic body composition and have a bad metabolic profile. So bad cholesterol levels, insulin, blood glucose, et cetera. There's a lot of things that are also involved with not just nutrition, but once again, the lifestyle, the genetics, and how all of those are going to work together. So it's typically more difficult and you're going to, on average, have better metrics within a normal body composition range as opposed to an obese and overweight range, but you're going to see aberrations on both sides. So you cannot ever use the always statements here because it's not how things work. Instead, it's important that you figure out, once again, where do they feel the best? What can they maintain for long periods of time? What's going to the be the best way for them to go about it. Does that make sense to you guys? Thank you, Sam. So what we have here is just some basic realms of body composition for athletes in these given sports, which once again, is a great indicator for the fact that these people have never really worked with these athletes. They're just throwing out arbitrary numbers because uh, real fast up here, guys, what's something that you find that is obviously wrong for uh, sports and specifically body composition on this table? And feel free to unmute yourself if you find it. Yeah, yeah, a 15% offensive lineman, I've never seen that before. Even now, defensive linemen, we've had a couple that were that lean, but the fact that they're at like high end is 19, they've obviously never seen professional football. If you have a gut that hangs out over your stomach, yeah, bodybuilders, actually, that's probably a little bit high, absolutely. Personally, my favorite egregious error is the fact that notice it says baseball, 12 to 18% for females. What's the sport that we typically call it for uh, when females play a ball that has a, a uh, you know, they have a ball, they use a bat, and they run around the bases? Yeah, they call it softball, don't they? So, guys, the key is it, the nice thing it, I do like about it is it shows that for the most part, you can have a relatively wide range. But these are effectively made up. You don't see these athletes in reality because I test them. Well, tested them in the lab when the world was still functioning. And that it turns out we would find a myriad of body composition. And what I do enjoy is the weightlifting and the wrestling, the idea that you only go to 60%. If you're a super heavyweight, oh boy, you can be as big as you want to be. And they do. So that body fat percentage would be, I would say, in some cases, getting closer to 30% in it for some of those athletes. So just understand it's a wide range. In fact, because uh, I know we've got some D1 athletes on here, and he's next to be picked on anyway. So Jackson, when it comes to your team, and I understand that you know you have you've done XFIS, you're 
you don't have exactly the greatest amount of training in body composition, but given the teammates that you've both played with now and played with in the past or summer ball and everything else, what would you say like the leanest guy you've ever played with body comp was, and then also the highest body comp you've ever seen with a baseball player? Um, I'll say my freshman year, we had this, uh, this catcher that was, he was probably 300 and, 300 pounds and uh I mean he was a short guy but he I mean he was a good catcher mm -hmm. um but I mean I'd say he had upwards of 20 percent mm -hmm. uh, and then the leanest guy um probably with a freshman on our team right now Ryan Nelson he's really he's really cut I'd say his is pretty pretty low yeah, and, you know, we haven't had a chance to test you guys this year because of whatever, but the lowest that we've seen with you guys, and this is over the time, I've seen a couple of them that were legit single digits. So I think it was like a mm -hmm. seven or eight. So, I mean, that's, that's pretty darn lean. And we had one guy that was actually closer to 30%. And these yeah. are baseball players. Now, the one thing that I'll throw out on top of there, and I always enjoy saying it whenever it comes to the sport of baseball, is are you familiar with uh, Prince and Cecil Fielder? Oh, for sure. Yeah. How many high-level power hitters in the league would arguably have body fat levels that might be over 30%? A lot. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. They can drive. A lot of pitchers, up. too. Let's say it again? Is that a lot of pitchers, too? Yeah. Because it turns out body composition in a sport like baseball is not anywhere near as important as your ability to either throw that ball really hard and accurately or to obviously be able to hit the ball really hard specifically against obviously incredible levels of pitching so it's just to be that's just one thing to be mindful of so thank you jackson because i obviously wanted to touch on the fact that you have a variety of body types in a lot of sports now certain sports like gymnastics cross country uh, swimmers you tend to see very similar body types so that's where that body comp is going to be a little bit tighter even then you still have a range now when we say models guys remember we're talking about how effectively how many parts are we breaking the body into? So two compartment means it's essentially just two buckets. We've got fat mass and then we've got lean mass or fat free mass. Now fat free mass is not just muscle, it's tendon, it's bone, it's ligament, it's skin, it's internal organ. Fat mass is not just what makes you self-conscious of the beach, but that's also going to be your nervous system, your bone marrow. Now then we go into the three compartment model where we've got fat mass, fat free mass, and then we have bone mass. And then when we go to the four compartment model, fat mass, lean mass, bone mass, water. And so we can, each of those has advantages because we can effectively see where's the weight at in the body and how is it changing over time? Because that's really what's more important for body composition really when you're working with athletes. Taking someone's body composition once is not that useful other than to make them either feel bad about themselves or make them feel good about themselves. What's really important is to have that body compositional information and be able to show how it changes over time. So are you gaining muscle? Are you losing muscle? Are you gaining fat? Are you losing fat? Are you gaining bone mineral density? Or are you losing bone mineral density? And so in the upper right corner, we've got underwater weighing, where you get to drown yourself with style, which is based on the reality that it turns out because part of us is buoyant when we're underwater, it's going to cause us to be much lighter and the differential between how much you weigh underwater and how much you weigh above water gives us an idea of how much you weigh. We then are going to have the wonders of the bod pod that we have in the lab, though it's not as chicly put together with the backdrop behind it, but it's going to do the same thing where it's estimating your density and from there it's gonna give us an idea of body composition. This right here is just looking at the air variance that you're gonna see in individuals from one day to the next in that it turns out it's pretty good, but it's not perfect. Our bodies are constantly changing. We then have bioelectrical impedance, where we're literally gonna see how fast electricity travels through the body, which gives us information then about lean mass, fat mass, and bone mass based upon estimations. Uh, yes, Courtney. Two compartment, fat mass, lean mass. Three compartment, fat mass, lean, or fat free mass, bone mass. Four compartment, Fat mass, lean mass, bone mass, water. So 
the bone and the water are going to be subtracted from what was previously that fat mass. So it's more or less just like protein. But they're each giving us different fractions of how the body is broken down because every single cell in our body is wrapped in a phospholipid bilayer. So we literally are wrapped every cell of our body in fat. It just turns out that's a very thin layer relative to the rest of the cell. But then we have our fat cells, which are anywhere from 10 to 50% water. And so their fat cells aren't purely fat themselves. It's hence why it gets real weird real fast when you start working the body. Now, BMI is an old school method that works really good when you're dealing with big swaths of the population, but even then it kind of sucks because all it is is your weight divided by your height. And it was developed in the 1800s by a mathematician that really meant to have it be kgs over meters to the 2.5th power, but because of a lack of computing power in the early 1800s, it just became kilograms divided by meters squared. So at least it's a good cut and dry one, but it turns out, you know, I'm too ten and some change because my wife had me weigh in this morning because we say that I'm looking skinny because I miss you guys and I'm, I've, I'm, I'm not eating as much as I once was. But it turns out I'm obese by BMI because my BMI, because I'm not very tall, is close to being over 30. Now, whenever I say my numbers to somebody over the phone, they don't know if it's 200 pounds of mostly jiggle or 200 pounds of mostly flex. And I will flex on any dude who's specifically my age at a public pool any day of the week. I don't want to take on you young guys. You guys are in way too good a shape. But I'll take on the old folks because I got a chance there. Now, we can also look at things like our waist circumference, specifically our waist to hip ratio, at least gives us a little bit of information as to how we're carrying this body mass, specifically also how we're carrying the body fat. Because there's the android adiposity, which is more around the stomach, and then the gynoid adiposity, which is mostly around the hips and the thighs. And if we're carrying more in the hips and the thighs relative to our abdomen, it tends to have better outcomes for overall health. But the bigger key is not to have that high body fat in the first place. Now, densitometry is what we talked about previously of the underwater weighing or the bog pod. We've got skin folds. We're literally taking skin fold girths of a, different, a number of different locations on the body, which is letting us know effectively how much fat is in that area. And then from there, using formulas, extrapolating what your body fat would be. There's the dual energy X-ray absorbentometry or DEXA scanners. That's what we have in the lab we're able to do a total body x-ray and give you lean mass, fat mass, and bone mass. But what's really good about that one is it literally goes region by region throughout the body. So it can compare the muscle mass on your left leg to the muscle mass on your right leg, from your left arm to your right arm. And that's where we see, especially with the pitchers in baseball and softball, we'll see as much as a two pound difference in lean mass between their throwing arm and their non-throwing arm. Now there's computed uh, tomography and magnetic resonance imaging, so CT scans and MRIs that can also give really good local information because it cuts the body into slices. It's obviously even more expensive, but it can give some pretty good information. And air displacement plethysmography is just a modification on densitometry. It's literally, you sit in that bod pod, it slowly changes the air pressure inside of it. And if you have a bigger individual inside, the pressure changes even more so because there's less empty space inside of it. And then there's multi-component models where we're going to use a number of these different systems all together that in turn is going to go ahead and give us an even better indicator of what body comp is because all of these have got issues with accuracy. They're, none of them are perfect. All of them have air built into them. And so the more ways that we can slice it, the better off we are. So this is just to show the example of how we have either more or less resistance depending on if we're going through a salt solution or a salt solution with oil, hence why the bioelectrical impedance is useful. Now, absorbitometry is just using one frequency. Spectroscopy is using many, which is quite useful. Then we have our skin fold measurements. So this is your typical three sites when dealing with women, and then three sites and even four, actually, because I got a super iliac here. Now, the only thing that's wrong about this is all this should be on the right side of the body. And your, oh, that's, sorry, that's the four side, and then that's the three side, but they should all be on the right side. Now, from here is based upon the cumulative addition of all of those skin folds, what we in turn figure your body fat composition would be 
depending on the age group you're in, because the way skin pinches and otherwise can change with time. And plus, we figure you're going to be increasing the total amount of fat that's literally inside of your muscles as you get older as kind of a, an effective literally age. And then also, once again, that BMI. So hence, you go to me, about 210 and 59. I am morbidly obese. Boom. It hurts. It hurts every time I have to be told that. But Tinks doesn't care. Tinks is too smitten by yelling at a bird out there that she wants to murder. Isn't that true? Yeah. One day, one day you're going to get that, Robin. So this is that example of a guy that's six foot tall is 195 and obviously lean compared to 195 and not so lean. Now, turns out both guys are the same height, same weight, and that's the big issue with BMI. You still need to be able to see the person. And the other thing that we're really overlooking here is you can have people that have a normal BMI or even only a slightly overweight BMI but their body fat percentage is incredibly high because they don't have any lean mass. All they have is fat mass. And some people refer to this, uh, I believe the colloquial term, which is not the nicest, uh, is sometimes referred to as a tofi, thin on the outside, fat on the inside. Um, but it's important to keep in mind because muscle is very metabolically active tissue, and it's obviously far more useful for just everything in general, plus that is our major protein reserves. And then we have our waist hip measurement, so hence the narrowest point of the waist, the widest point of the hips, and whatever that measurement tends to be, is a slight indicator of body comp. But the nice thing is that's really cheap. You can do that at home. You don't need any special equipment. You can just figure out how you're doing and where you're at. Now, these are different ways that you can extrapolate effectively what your density is going to, in turn, give you for your body composition. Now, this is part of that underwater weighing, which obviously can be useful, but is not something that's a hundred, it's not the best way to go about it because you have to hold your body underwater with all of the airs out of your lungs until your weight stabilizes so they can get a measurement. And so in fact, hey honey, how comfortable was doing the underwater weighing when you were in college? Did they even turn on the water or the heat in your guys' tub? Yeah, if, if you guys ever, when we're back to where we can see each other, if you guys want to do underwater weighing, we have the stuff put together that we can literally set it up in the athlete's uh, athletic training room on the first floor of uh, Moberly. So if you guys ever want to do it, we can totally make that happen. But after I did that for one or two semesters and saw the look of absolute uh, disdain on my students' faces, I decided we would file that underneath the heading of let's not and say we didn't. So, but we have here, guys, is when we're looking at body composition is making sure that we understand the difference between accuracy and precision, okay? Accuracy is how close we are to the bullseye. Precision is how consistent are our results. So it's easy to think of it as like the groupings whenever you happen to be utilizing uh, like you're citing a gun. So if it's making the same mistake consistently, that's letting you know that obviously it's off, but at least you know how much it's off by. Now, all body comp is inaccurate. Dex is going to be off by 1%. Uh, bod pod is going to be off by maybe 3 to 5. Ours is older, that's why I say that. Um, skin fold calipers, especially when it's done by the undergrad, is usually going to be off by 10 or more percent. But the key is you want to have the same person doing the measurement over and over again so you can really figure out what's going on with those changes. And that plays back into when we talk about the changing someone's body weight for being in a caloric deficit or caloric surplus and the nitrogen balance. So when we get them to gain weight, are they gaining the type of weight we want them to gain? Or are they losing the type of weight we're hoping for them to lose? Because the issue that you have is a lot of people get in their mind, I need to weigh X amount. And that is not necessarily wrong, but it can often be misguided. 
Because for example, yes, I am not tall and I am morbidly obese by BMI, but my body fat is definitely not in the single digits. I am definitely not doing laundry on my abs anytime soon, but I can see a number of them because anything after, here's your um, D bag statement, but it's a good one to fall back on when you're a guy like myself. Uh, so the gentlemen that are 200 pounds and heavier, remember this line, abs on a guy that weighs less than 200 pounds just shows malnutrition. I got a little snicker out of my wife, so I'll count that as a win. So like anything else, yes, I could still afford to lose some body fat. That would bring me down a little bit out of the obese range, but all of my blood lipid profile, my blood pressure, everything else is good. I don't need to lose any weight to actually enhance my health. And a lot of people that you're going to meet that are maybe just a little bit overweight, that's fine. And you can be overweight. In fact, what we find it's a J-shaped curve. You actually have an increased risk of injury of illness and otherwise when you're underweight and then it actually hits the bottom of that trough because it's like it's a j-shape like kind of like a nike swoosh is going to be pretty much right around a bmi of 25 and those who get to the 25 and we start going back up and then we get into obesity class one two three four and now it's like okay it's definitely not healthy for me at this height to be 250 pounds or especially to be 300 pounds like, that is a lot of mass on not that big of a skeleton like that is not going to be good for my long-term health, but everything else is negotiable. So when you're working with your athlete, with yourself, with your family member, your patient, your subject, the key is to often first try to aim for recomposition, meaning we're going to try and increase lean mass while we decrease fat mass. And if we stay the same body fat or same body weight, while decreasing our body fat, we're going to probably look better. Now, yes, we might not be the Shape Magazine nonsense that all females need to weigh 120 pounds, but we're going to feel better, we're going to perform better, and we're probably going to be healthier for it if we just focus on, for your average American, recomposition. And for those that are legitimately obese, we're going to also look into potentially decreasing that overall body mass, but once again, what's feasible and what can be maintained over the long term. And the last thing to keep in mind, guys, and this is another fascinating fact, is the BMI is, BMI is not necessarily racist, but what you do see is massive variance between races in that BMI works really good for Caucasians. That's about it. If you happen to be African American or Hispanic, typically your average African American, your average Hispanic individual has naturally a higher BMI. This can be because of naturally greater amounts of lean mass, bone mineral density, and so on. And your average individual of Asian descent typically has a lower BMI. So racially, you can have some differences that are influenced by genetics. I come from a family of dwarves. My dad is built just like me, only shorter and angrier. My little sister is built like me, only female and way shorter and way angrier. And my mom, she's nice, but she's also short and she's naturally kind of a broad person. So like, no matter what, I was probably always going to be just due to skeletal structure, more towards the overweight body weight, just because of the way I'm built. And then obviously I enjoy resistance training and otherwise and that's kind of caused the weight to go up even more so, which I'm fine with. That's what my goal has been. Um, well, it's a side effect of wanting to pick up and lift very heavy things, which typically makes you heavier specifically in muscular weight. Where other of you guys come from families where you're naturally, you know, smaller frames, not necessarily in height, but just in little width. And so it's much easier for you to be smaller. And I know we've had conversations uh, like folks like Stephanie that get trouble from people about being of a smaller build, but there's nothing wrong with that. The key is once again, don't always consider body composition to be a really good indicator of somebody's overall health. It's just a piece of information and then we can figure out how it correlates with their health. And you can have false positives where people, because they're overweight, you think they're unhealthy and they're actually fine. And then you can have effectively a false negative where you have somebody that's like, oh, they got a normal body weight and otherwise, and in reality, they are not healthy with their 
actual body composition and more specifically with the things that really affect long-term health, blood pressure and those blood biomarkers. So what questions do you guys have about body composition? All right, Justin, ask me a question. So I'm not just talking to myself. Um, I don't really have any questions specifically come to mind right now. That's all right. Michaela, you got anything for me? Not anything that I can think of. Okay. Sam? What is a healthy BMI, or does it matter as long as, like, an individual can compete at the demands and level required of them? So that's the thing. Is in reality, I would, I would argue a healthy BMI is usually between eighteen point five to potentially, you know, thirty or slightly more if you're dealing with a really muscular individual that's still, you know, relatively lean. So it's a, it's a relatively broad range. And the problem with BMI is it typically makes shorter individuals seem like they actually have a healthier uh, body mass index because it naturally overpowers. Uh, so short people seem like they're actually of a, of a lower class than they would be. And it makes taller people because it doesn't scale upward as much as it should. It makes it seem like they're heavier than they should be. So the key is, it's just something like, okay, if you can physically see the individual, you take the BMI number and you throw it in the trash can. If you can't see the individual and that's the only thing you got, it at least gives you something to start off with, but then you need more points of information before you can make sweeping statements. Did that answer your question? Yes. Awesome. Stephanie, anything? Um. I can't remember if you actually like talked about that, but I was just kind of wonder about like the football players who are like really big, you know, when they like, like they're just like the linemen, they're just really big and they obviously have to have a lot of fat. Is that like healthy still? <laughs> no, no, it's not. Um, playing in sports and playing on a high level, it's a, it's an inverted U when it comes to physical activity and your ability and your health. When you're going from being sedentary to moderately trained to maybe even like, you know, well-trained, your overall health is probably better for it. But when you start trying to be a high level athlete in a number of sports, you're effectively putting your health in the trash can. Now, some of them you throw it into a burning trash can. Others, it's just like, okay, it's not good for you. Because no matter what, if you're trying to really be, especially that lineman example, you've got to be to such a body size, there's very few humans that can just physically carry that amount of muscle mass and everything else without having some type of issue with maybe pre-diabetes, blood pressure, blood lipid profile, something that's going off and getting wonky. And the other thing is, oh, I don't know, the fact that I love to colloquially refer to uh, that sport as brain damage ball for the fact that we know they're literally exploiting and you know risking a number of different components of their health aside from obviously the wonders of traumatic injury because you've been around the football team enough to realize that every single one of those linemen is wearing double knee braces because there's a legitimate chance they're going to blow one of those things out and they're trying to at least minimize that risk so yes you are correct in that it's highly unlikely that you're going to be able to be an offensive lineman with no negative effects on health. But here's the thing. We're all making choices, at least for those linemen. They're hopefully a little bit more mindful. And I noticed this at the word, hopefully mindful of the fact that they are perhaps risking their health so they can play that sport better. And then when they're done playing the sport, they're going to try to get down to a lower body weight because they don't need to be a 300 pound human anymore. If you're seven feet tall, yeah, you're probably gonna be closer to 300 pounds than you know most average humans. 
but even then like it's i can't really see of a good reason why a human being needs to be over 300 pounds for a normal life meaning you're not trying to be you know half more thorson world's strongest man you're not trying to be vince wolfork playing in the nfl you're not trying to be a legit high level athlete it's like yeah i'm sacrificing my health so i can make that paper or make other people hurt because i enjoy it whatever but yeah it's 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 going to be nigh impossible for most people to maintain those sizes completely healthy and that's obviously that's a really gray area in the first place when you say what is completely healthy so does that answer your question stephanie yes it does i always kind of wondered about that so thanks <laughs> yeah, and i think one of the disservices and something that i would like to try to help with um and we've we've tried to initiate it but it's it's one of those things that it's hard to get the uh the cloud behind it which is to literally have kind of a post-athletic career program for athletes like okay like when you're done being a division one athlete like here's how to eat like a normal human here's how to take care of your body here's how to do all these things because you've had other people micromanaging it and then you know once again you've been trading parts of your health for performance and uh yeah so thank you stephanie let's go ahead and let's pick on taryn speaking um, your health for performance so what's the point of having these bmi standards if like they're not really accurate because anytime like i do that kind of testing i'm like always way obese and like overweight which i'm obviously not so what's the point of having the standard the reasoning for it is if you're doing things like epidemiology, so you're literally working with hundreds, if not thousands of people, and like you can't put eyes on them. And you need something that is incredibly simple that few people can screw up. So DEXA, scanner, DEXA scans are great, but the cheap, the cheap ones cost $100,000 to buy and then cost typically two to $4,000 each year to make sure that they're working appropriately. And that doesn't include, you know, licensure and everything else you need in order to operate one. So BMI is, is good if you're not seeing people or you don't have enough time to do things right, so to speak, because that's a real, it's a reality of like you're limited in how much time you have to access. So my wife does workplace wellness screenings. Uh, she was going to do them, but once again, obviously we are social distancing. And the way that they do that through uh, Humana Vitality, they, they just do BMIs, right, honey? It's just not the best, yeah. So they'll do, the, Lauren said they do a waist measurements and like body girth measurements, which you know, at least it's another way of looking at it. And, you know, as technology keeps improving, you're going to be able to get better and better measurements of individuals and be able from there to extrapolate, you know, what is effectively at least an idea of what their leanness is, which is going to be a better indicator. But it's just more of, it's just a technological limitation and a time limitation is going to come down to it. And yes, Taryn, you're doing fine. Just, it, it turns out all the, all the soccer ladies are probably and you know you you understand what i'm trying to say most ladies on the soccer team are heavier than people would probably think but they're also leaner than people would think like i've yet to see any of you guys that we've ever had like oh boy like i'm a little bit worried for their health and safety uh maybe yeah one or two where they've been perhaps a little too lean but even then that's been relatively rare but the bigger key is with an athlete what do you care about? If you cared about their health, you wouldn't have them playing a sport in all reality. So what we care about is their performance in the sport. So let's figure out where, in Taryn's example, playing collegiate soccer, where does she play the best? Where does she recover the best? Meaning both body weight and body composition. Maybe you're going to do better out there on the field if you're five to 10 pounds heavier, whether that weight is the type that jiggles or flexes, maybe you're just better because you're literally a bigger human so you can bowl over the smaller ones. Or maybe you're going to play better if you happen to just, I don't know, gained a little bit of muscle, lost a little bit of fat. Like that's just, you have to kind of 
talk to your athletes, have the conversations and figure out, you know, what's really best for them and where they're going to perform the best. And when you're dealing with overall health, like, yeah, then we want to relate that to those blood biomarkers. Like, Hey, you know, you can have the people that, yeah, they're like, Oh boy, like they look heavy. And then everything comes back completely normal and fine. Like, it's like, damn, they have an immaculate blood look profile. And then you'll have the other folks, which don't get me wrong. It's like one third of individuals that are OV, obese and overweight have completely number uh, normal blood metrics. But then the antithesis is true where it's about one third of individuals that are normal BMI actually have pretty bad blood biomarkers. Cause it turns out, yeah, they don't show it by having higher, higher amounts of adiposity. Instead that shows itself as a bad lipid profile and so on. So does that answer your question, Taryn? Yeah. Awesome. And so last but not least, Trey, you got anything for me to field? I was going to ask, um, um, could it change like your diet plan? Uh, can you athlete if you kind of type that in that would be great or something kind of came in really uh, scratchy i couldn't really understand you uh, And Trey has disappeared. So, did any of you guys understand what he was trying to say? Okay. Well, it looks like he's trying to join again, but I don't know if it's working for him. So, Trey, if you want, try one more time to answer or to ask the question for me. Uh, feel free to just type it into the chat. Otherwise, we will go ahead and, uh, yeah, wrap up and call it a night. Can you hear me? Yes, no, I can hear you. Go for it. All right. So, what I was trying to ask was, like, when you're trying to find correct BMI for a certain position or whatever sport, does it really mm -hmm. help you, like, determine – certain diet plans or what they should do to get to where they need to be? Is there like, is there anything to follow or? I don't know. Ooh, okay. No, that's a good question. So like anything else, that's where it can be useful to kind of look at athletes that are successful at that level. So if you're going to talk obviously professional football and you want to be a professional football lineman, you typically as an offensive lineman, you got to weigh at least 300 pounds. Now to be a high level college lineman, you get some that are pretty successful. My new depends on the level. We're talking about there's a big difference between D1, uh, AA, D1A, D2, D3, and NAIA. But you'll see some linemen that are successful that are only like 270, 280 pounds. And then in the high school level, you get some folks that are successful and they only weigh a little bit over 200 pounds or right at, and they're just a, you know, a smaller, meaner person. So the first lens to figure out is effectively, given the age group that I'm working with, what's more important? Like what's the body compositional range that you tend to see success in that's going to work for my athlete. And then what's a feasible change. So let's say you give me a high school freshman boy and he wants to be a offensive lineman in college. And he comes from parents that are both dads five, six and moms five, three. I'm going to tell him no, unless he's adopted but it's just not going to happen because he's probably not going to be big enough and the amount of weight and everything else you're going to have to put on that kid. It's like, Oh gosh, good Lord. Like there's some, some risks there that I would prefer not to try and do. Now let's say uh, I'm going to two of the, two of your fellow students, uh, at least before all this started uh, happening, they were definitely in a relationship. Uh, she plays 
or played on the volleyball team as one of their hitters. So she's like 6'1 or 6'2. And he is uh, one of the offensive linemen that we have at EKU. And he's like 6'3, 6'4. Now, both of them are incredibly pleasant people. I like them a lot. Um, it's kind of funny. He actually trains at the same YMCA that I train at when we're uh, back I'm with my in-laws for the holidays. So he's the, and, you know, he's a large person, hard to miss. Now, if they ever have kids, like, okay, that kid's probably going to be a big damn kid. And if that kid ends up wanting to be a football player and he comes in as, you know, 5'11", as a freshman that weighs like a buck sixty and he hasn't really hit puberty yet, well, let's go into it with the goal that we're just going to try to add 10 to 20 pounds per year to that athlete's frame. So he's just going to graduate high school, and if we do the 20 pounds per year, so that's 80 pounds, at 230 pounds. Like, yeah, he still has growing left to do, and that's fine. If he's, you know, has a lot of athleticism, he can get himself playing college ball somewhere. Okay. That first year red shirt, they might try to put another 20, 30 pounds on him. Now he's like 250, 260, and you keep going and you're going, and you try to make those consistent changes. The slower we try to shift our body, meaning that half a pound or one pound or the half a percent to 1% per week, the easier it is to make that sustainable and the easier that is to deal with physiologically for the body. If we're trying to change our body weight two, three, four, five percent per week, like that is insanely hard. When we talk about those effects of both up and down regulation of resting metabolic rate, of how you're going to have the changes in your NEAT levels, all of those are going to make it a lot harder to make that something that can be maintained for a long period of time. And it's going to be honestly a lot more uncomfortable. So think of it along the lines of what's my long-term goal with my athlete and then make sure that we're slowly shifting them there. And we have lost Trey again. I love working with the internet. So, oh, good, he's back. Any other questions you guys want me to field? Otherwise, we'll go ahead and call it a night. And you guys stay safe out there. Well, seeing as how I'm talking to myself, you guys be safe. Take care of yourselves. Miss you guys. And you know, if you ever need anything, just shoot me an email and hopefully we'll talk more online soon. Bye-bye.